Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Carlos Soto, I'm a young urbanist, and I will I have the opportunity now to present and share to you a little bit of my work uh, from my master thesis. I'm going to share just mostly the theoretical part so we can have a discussion on this topic that is now gaining attention, which is circular economy, but specifically how circular economy can be an approach to urban planning and design. So before, let's look at some numbers. And okay, so we have some global facts, which is that 3 million people are moving to cities every week, according to the UN, and only 2% of the land of the earth occupy the city, but this is the place where 80% of the GDP is produced. And 70% of the global resource consumption happens in urban areas. Also, the same amount of energy related to greenhouse gases emissions. Half of the population lives in urban areas, and also 50% of the waste generated lives in urban areas. And this is projected to grow up to 20% by 2050, reaching 70%. So something that we have to take into account is that for the first time ever, it seems to be the case that the financial world is meeting the environmental issues. Now we talk about green economies, climate finance, green bonds, loans, carbon markets, and there is this sort of recognition of climate risk as financial risk also. And this moment, um, Carlos, sorry, just to just to interrupt you. Nick says that the sound's not great, isn't? I don't know if you could get a bit closer to your microphone or. Okay. Yeah. Try say something now. And see if that sounds any better. Yeah. Yeah, the, the microphone is in the camera, so yeah. Uh, okay, okay, that sounds a bit better. I'll mute myself again. So yeah, and I'll cut this bit out, obviously. All right. Okay. So um, from this context is where the circular economy concept emerged. And this is a concept that integrates um, ideas of industrial ecology, regenerative design, cradle to cradle and other previous concepts, which the main idea is try to loop the cycles within them, within the systems. So this is an evolving concept. Initially, it was applied to the industries, and then it evolved as an economic system that is not only could be applied not only to the micro but to the micro level. And the latest definitions of it by organizations such as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Bank is that it is actually a system level approach that can be applied not only to the micro and macro but meso levels. But what about cities? So as I said before, this concept of circular economy comes from industrial ecology and industrial metabolism, but this concept also has an urban version of it, which is the urban metabolism and urban ecology, which, which are concepts that you maybe have come across. And these associated to our current race towards sustainable development and climate action grow this idea of how the urban metabolism is actually associated to circular economy and hence circular cities. Um, how can we look at the metabolism of cities? So by theory, the urban metabolism is a descriptive concept that describes how the inputs of materials, water, energy, and all of these resources uh, get into the urban systems, are consumed, transformed, and during those processes, there are emissions and waste associated. But the, on the other hand, the circularity or the circular economy is a prescriptive concept, bringing the idea of uh, putting those outputs again in the system or looping them as inputs again for the urban systems. So when we look at urban resources, we have, of course, water, energy, raw materials, the typical. But as urban planners and designers, we also have social spatial inputs which are our built assets, land, people, capital, and the goods produced by the industries and, and the businesses that are located in our cities. 
And these are parts of different systems that build and property systems, social productive systems, and for the natural and ecological systems. So by definition, a circular city is a city that invents this principle, uh, establishing urban systems that are regenerative and restorative by design, where waste is eliminated and the assets are kept, um, kept their utility at all times. But also gaining attention and ground in the academy and practice, there is still like uh, the few definition or emerging definitions about what a circular city is according to every context of application. We have circular Glasgow, we have circular London, Amsterdam, Brussels, Paris, and all of them have uh, different approaches. But uh, some kind of proposals to visualize these urban systems through the lens of circularity uh, that I made in my thesis is by looking some of these systems, for example, we have the built and property system traditionally in urban planning and design. We look at buildings and land as part of the real estate market. We take care, of course, of the value and land. We plan to, to develop uh, according to the benefits, social, economic, and environmental benefits of these um, assets and also taking into account account urban activities. But from the circular economy perspective, we have to take into account that buildings are also um, stock material or they have material content. And we have to direct or guide the design both physically and functionally, functionally these assets. Also taking into account that there is not only a single use or a long-term use, but also a temporary use of those use. Uh, an example on the right, bottom right, there is there are cities in Denmark that already take uh, waste on construction and they just recover material to put it again in the system by building new assets with them. And on the left, we have this already pretty known tactical urbanism, which is already mainstream, but is still relevant for implementing the ideas of circularity. Then we have social productive systems with the different stakeholders and actors that we usually in traditional planning, we try to cover the demands and we look at the interactions among them, we try to involve them in our plans. But also from the circular perspective, we would need to look at how the procurement of the urban activities is taking place and what's the consumption and production pattern of these activities. What is uh, what are the opportunities to localize the the resource flow of these activities? Also, from the citizens' perspective, we have to look at them from the behavioral point of view, their consumption choices, the potential entrepreneurship, and the potentialities of implementing services offered to us. We have some examples like schemes, like the one in the middle, pay as you throw. Uh, this is these are implementing some kind of labels to try to weight the amount of waste you generate also with the amount of money you need to pay in order to process them. And also locally produced food. And on the right, we have this idea that actually came from Canada and now is trying to be implemented in Glasgow, the converting waste bread into beer. So these are from the social productive perspective. And in the energy and mobility system, which is the brain infrastructure, of course, we look at them or we plan them in order to satisfy needs mostly, but they are also material. They, they have material content and we have to try to think um, and to look at them as um, networks that could have the possibility to establish a symbiosis. We have, of course, the examples that we know um, of converting waste to energy. And there are, there are also new uh, approaches in design, such as the ones uh, here in, in, in Scotland. They have the um, Park Power Initiative, which, which is uh, quite recent. And also in Edinburgh, they have already designed some places that implement this approach of producing energy locally. Then we have the natural system, which it's pretty recognized the importance of it, the, uh, how conservation and the preservation of ecosystems is important. But in the regulations and in practice, it is always um, taken 
like the enforcement of it is mostly done in the outskirts of the city. And it is, for the green belt, actually taken into the inner city as an actual asset that should be now looked at it as um, green infrastructures, blue infrastructures in order to provide ecosystem services. So, well, some examples, of course, the brown roof to provide spaces for biodiversity, urban biodiversity, and rainwater harvesting mechanisms and all the kinds of um, infrastructure that could help to provide services. The how of circular city is a tricky question because as I said before, how to implement or what kind of actions should you implement a circular city? It's a question that every city approach in a different, from a different perspective. But if you look at the general frameworks that are uh, provided by these organizations, such as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and other multilateral organisms, uh, I, I evaluated the similarities and also I did a kind of matrix of connections between the different, the scope of the plants, the urban plants, and I took Glasgow as an example. And I found that, for example, looping and adaptation of optimization tends to be the most feasible uh, when it comes to implementing or embedding this kind of action, actions in the urban plan. And for in terms of scales, when we do the comparison, of course, we have to look at scales differently when we work in planning. We don't look at products specifically, but in the micro level, for example, we look at buildings, the sites, and the urban activities. We cannot control what they produce directly, but we can provide some guidelines and regulations in order to foster the greener approaches for producing the services and goods they provide. So as an exercise in Glasgow, for example, for my thesis, I mapped some variables. I will only show briefly three of them. One is the material content. I calculated, for example, in Glasgow, all the material content in the building stock for 90% of the buildings. And we are talking about around 50 million tons of material that could be at some point uh, or uh, mine, as I mean, if we take the concept of urban mining in the long term, but could be also, we could establish some strategies for middle term mining of non uh, structural materials. Sorry. We have another variable that is pretty known, which is the waste gate or the wasteland, but not only the land or back end and derelict land, but also the buildings that are empty or at risk, and also the draw scape from infrastructure, which is uh, representing Glasgow uh, a fair amount. And these spaces sometimes are categorized as green corridors when they actually don't offer an ecosystem service or the land is just grassland that is underused. We have also the activities I identified using the ordinance service from March 2020, the different retail and commercial activities that could be categorized as circular according to the core strategies of uh, renting, re uh, recycling, and all of these principles. The most common are um, the farm shops in Glasgow are the most, most common, but overall, from all the retail and commercial activity, only 6% of these could be categorized as circular. And in terms of the flows, we could see that, for example, there are different strategies to implement. If a building is at the end of their life, it's going to be demolished. There are ways to uh, separate these materials and converting them as aggregates for pavements or bioenergy or different appliances, or such as insulation for new buildings. And or if they are being retrofitted, there should be guidance in order to make them more flexible for future use in, instead of I mean, to, to prevent demolition. Uh, also the same with the land. Uh, if, it's, if it has the potential to be developed or not, and the strategies are different, but I will not be into it. If you want to more details, then I can show you more, send you by email this presentation. And then the same with the businesses. 
But overall, the application of circular economy as an approach uh, invites to the thinking urban coding in policy, of course, piloting to the traditional land uses, identifying urban mining potential, not only for the long, but for the middle term, and adapting services and facilities, because we might start thinking about material banks and the platforms that could uh, support these kind of facilities, could be digital platforms to communicate the availability of certain material and also to monitor the flow of these materials. And also experimenting with living labs. And I put the question here, maybe we should bring back again some ideas of trans transition towns. And so in conclusion, circularity is context specific, is, la is more oriented to life cycle and metabolic approaches, and it's an add-on rather than a switch to the way we plan and design. But it can contribute to resilience and sustainability in climate action. Well, I did interviews for the thesis and I found that in most cases they wrote uh, as a comment of resilience that COVID-19, for example, in Glasgow, um, brought this situation where some buildings need, needed to be used uh, with a different uh, with a different use than the one that was designed for music venues, etc., for supporting health uh, health facilities. So this is kind of, this kind of flexibility and thought comes. Or, or is supported by circularity. So at the end, it's, 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 this idea is um, nurturing the, the idea of resilience too. And in terms of climate action, because climate action is associated directly to this, the resource crisis that we are facing nowadays for building our cities. So that's it. And again, this is just a conceptual part of the work I did, but if you want, uh, to know more about the different variables I took into account or the case itself in Glasgow, I can send you more information. But this is just to start a conversation. Great, thanks, Carlos. You can stop sharing your screen. All right. Yeah. Um, thanks for bearing with us with the with the sound, it got a bit better, I think. And I also, I've, I've got the video, so I'll check the sound on that. Um, okay. and that's anything that we need to, to do. Um, lots of really, really relevant things there. And I think links to previous talks um, that we've had before, especially Thomas sort of looking at the, the donut model. I think that sort of, there's links there. Um, when you were doing your thesis and your research, um, what would you say were the big, barriers what, what's the main barrier to this happening because it's it's common sense really isn't it to be reusing and making the most yeah of but the ones i identified through the stakeholders through the interviews because i had an interview with the three promoters of the circular glasgow for example okay the chamber of commerce the city council and zero waste and the barriers are mostly legal but they say that there is a barrier but also a an opportunity because there is some sort of backing from the Scottish government. We have a national level strategy for circular economy, but still to bring that to the local level, there are some um, challenges in terms of uh, embedding that into our current, how, I mean, it's still diffuse. How can we embed those regulations and guidelines to the planning applications, for example? Um, and that will take time. That, that's something that cannot be overnight. And apart from that, another challenge that maybe because of the current situations uh, that arose as a challenge is the, the pandemic is redirecting the resources somehow. So there are um, split opinions. So one group thinks that this could benefit actually the implementation of circular initiative because then it's like a driver, like you have to start thinking about flexibility, as you say at the end. But on the other hand, if you are redirecting the, the funding to attend this particular situation, then the circularity or other greener approaches are put in on hold financially, and it will then take longer time. Um, are there any places that do it well? You know, is there yeah. anywhere that's already doing this that we could 
Uh, you mean other cities or? Yeah, I suppose so. Other cities well, are the most typical in the academy. The most cited case are in Amsterdam and Brussels. Those two, because they have taken the circularity to this level. It's not only the businesses and how they can um, promote recycling in the city, but also they are taking it to the construction sector, which is probably the most um, challenging to, to address. So those two and the Nordic cities, but the Nordic cities, not in terms of construction sector, but in terms of energy, like they have already implemented different models that have functioned for them. And, and in, the academ in the academic work, they used to take them as a reference for, for that decarbonization of the, of the network, basically. So on that first example, you said Amsterdam and somewhere else. Sorry, the sound is a bit funny off and Brussels. on. Oh, Br okay, Brussels. Okay, that's great. Um, does anyone have any other any questions or thoughts uh, for Carlos? Just pop your little blue hand thing up. I can see two up. Um, Paul, do you want to if I unmute? Ask to unmute. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get in front of Brian because I know he'll have a long question. So. Uh, um, uh, a great talk, and I must admit, very interesting indeed. I, I think the one thing from my point of view is it actually comes back to what Rachel was asking there, is, you know, we don't, we can't even seem to get out of the norm of the way we build housing estates at the moment, you know, and it just seems that the idea of having labs, you know, actual constructed examples, seems to be a way to go forward if we're to make this work. Looking at overseas examples is is one thing, but I think we actually need to develop the technology and the understanding in this country. Uh, would you say that's the way to go or do you think there's another route? I think that, well, there are cases already uh, in Scotland that they have, retrofitting is not a new thing, like retrofitting of buildings. And of course, uh, in, even in Glasgow, that is a city that has this transition from from industrial to, to service city, et cetera. And there are a lot of buildings, around 440 uh, buildings at risk. There have been good cases, good practices. I identified in my thesis 80 buildings in particular and uh, that were using, like they changed not only the use, they did it not only the retrofitting, but the new use could be categorized as, as circular because our shared spaces and flexible. Uh, so yeah, I think locally there are some, some cases that could serve as a reference. Um, right. But in terms of technology, of course, because um, what I said before, you can take from demolition, you can take the recover some material, but in order to do that, you need the proper uh, technology to, to process them. Yeah. And, and I think that's still something that I'm not sure if in Scotland, uh, how um, how well advanced it is, but in this case that I put the picture about in Denmark, they have already been implementing this since 2017. Right. So there are well, I, 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 know, I know that Harriet Water um, they they've got a program running at the moment that's taking the material from uh, demolition works and actually producing bricks out of that that could be reused and recycled, which are actually lighter than the standard brick and they actually have a, um, a better thermal insulation quality as well. So there are programs, but it seems to be sort of, you know, quite disparate, you know, bits and pieces, but nothing really coordinated. And I think that's the thing, you know, you need a real sort of direction and impetus in order to make this come to fruition, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, so it's that time of the afternoon, isn't it? You need to <laughs> unmute, right? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to disappoint you, Paul, with a lengthy question. I, I thought there was a really interesting relationship between data concepts and graphics in your presentation. And a um, number of people are commenting uh, 
in the chat, they like the graphics. One of your diagrams in particular caught my eye. You had a map of Glasgow separated out by cells um, of a certain size. I don't know what grid size it was, um, which appeared to relate to quantities of built material in those cells, whether it's wood or um, stone, concrete. Yeah. I was wondering how you got those figures. So that, that was the that was the first question. Yes. And the corollary then is what's the relationship between quantification and quality in the quality qualitative assessment in the representation of your concepts? Um, because something I think is incredibly important these days when we all talk about data, um, but obviously ego applies. So if it's you got garbage in, you get garbage out. So I think it's very interesting if if we are going to represent ourselves as urbanists, look at quantities. We need to be pretty certain. So so how how did you get those figures for there's this many tons of wood in Pollock Shields, for example. Okay. No, well, I, the main uh, figure was the overall material, no wood, was combining all. But the separate maps that were the smaller ones on the left were by category. So in order to do that, I used, there is a paper which is quite recent from last year and the beginning of this year also, that they developed a global global indicators of for the building sector of residential and commercial buildings. And they had like a long list of indicators per country. And the one that was more complete actually was the one for the UK. So they had already established the indicator according to the residential type four categories, it could be row houses, it could be high rise, it could be um, detached houses. So I took those for every material. And of course the, the processing in GIS is just uh, the last version of the building footprint from ordinance survey. And I have to process that like to see at the height and estimate from the height dividing between four to get the number of stories and then apply, reduce that, um, that all that information into meter square because the indicators that I was used, using as a base were in meter square. So yeah, that was um, actually the approach for that map in particular. It is based in a global database of indicators for the building sector. Okay, so so you've used somebody's methodology somewhere. We look up a table and say, in this methodology, got a row house or a tenement. Um, then the the proportion of materiality in that is this much, and then for these square these grid squares in Glasgow, you looked at the figure ground pattern and you totted it up to say. Well, there's so much timber and so much concrete and so much stone in this grid in Glasgow. Yeah, according to the use of the building and the type of the building, like yeah. physically and functionally. What exactly is the point of that, Carlos? Well, the point of making this map? Yeah, I mean, okay, so we can we can make some some assumptions about embodied energy that goes into it, but it's there. So so it becomes relevant if if a building is becomes derelict, for example, and if you, you can look at something like this and say, well, there's this much embodied energy in that. But if you have this map of all this materiality around the city, what do you do? What, what does one do with that? You show it to yeah, well, as I said, as I said all, before, all this wood you've got in Glasgow. Yeah, as I said before, it could be seen as a long term potential of urban mining. But you can also take into account middle term if you 
look only at non-structural material. And that is a gap that I identify at the end of my dissertation, for example, like further knowledge required is to develop indicators separating non-structural uh, non material from the structural one, which is hard to recover also because it takes longer. But there are some um, appliances in the building that, that they are uh, maintained uh, even before the end of life of the building. And that's the non-structural material that we could uh, actually take care in low middle term. And also in terms of knowing the material, it has a possibility to further research in microclimate stuff. Because according to the type of material, if you have a predominance of glass, for example, in certain area of the city, that tells something about a possibility of certain microclimate associated to that material because of reflection, because of insulation, because of different factors that could affect the microclimate in that area. And the same, ha same happens with the um, back and derelict, derelict land. Usually most studies identify this back and derelict land and they just um, think about, well, we need to make use of it or repurpose it. But also uh, something that I find interesting and I put it in my thesis is that you can look at that uh, if you use the methodology of local climate zones, the bare soil has a different um, albedo potential, which is the, the, how they reflect the light from the sun and creates different temperatures. So the higher the amount of backhand land could be also associated to microclimate. But that's something I identify for further research, uh, trying to connect how actually circular, the idea of circularity or, or the perspective of circular analysis can lead to climate action plans. So it's not only the material or impacting the design, but also climate aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's, it's incredibly complex, isn't it? And it's kind of those maps that you shared with us are at that scale, very much a broad brush. I'm just going to mute you because I think your internet's making a funny noise. Um, but I'll unmute if you have a question. Um, I wondered a bit whether looking at circularity, for example, if you um, get planning permission for mineral workings, you have to have a restoration plan for that land, like 25, 30 years later after that mineral has been extracted. Do you, like moving forward with buildings, if you're building a new building, is there, so, you know, are considerations given for the future reuse of that material? Is that something that we should be thinking about now, rather than just being like, well, grind it all up and it'll be hardcore. Um, I've muted you, Carlos, if you wanted to. But also anybody else can come in as well. I know we've all got experience of. Yeah, I would need help for that one. <laughs> I mean, it's just a thought, really. I don't know if it exists. It just seems like it It potentially should. Um, I know when we were um, the Friday lecture series at GSA, um, I can't remember. Is it? Ch it might have been Chinchilla. It was an architect based in Spain who sort of whatever they were doing, they looked at how it could be dismantled and remade into something else. So for example, they did a pavilion at something like an expo. I'm sorry, I'm slightly hit. This is all just from my head. Um, and the, the, the pavilion was made from, you know, Harris fencing suspended with this and that, and it could all be unbolted and remade into something else afterwards. And there was a lot of consideration about reuse of materials um, and being able to dismantle when something okay. similar to what they did with the Olympic Park, right, in London. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, that's a good, yeah, that's a great example for a lot of things. It's also an example where the budget's gigantic. So it's sort of how do you trickle that down to the normal, the everyday city, I suppose, <laughs> to tie into Glasgow. Does anyone have it? We've got a, a few sort of like five minutes or so left. Don't know if anyone has any thoughts on what they heard or just general opinions. You're welcome to share them. Just looking at the the boxes. What's the what have you 
um, pasted Nick, Rota DC. No. Yeah, it's a it's a Belgian company who are getting quite a lot of um, coverage at the moment, uh, just in terms of looking at deconstruction. Oh, okay. Um, and how to recycle and reuse, but also then to start thinking about how you build that into the building process. Um, and it's, I mean, I think it's just really interesting from a um, sustainability point of view, you know, with all these sort of discussions about should you use concrete, should you use steel, the embodied energy, yep. but then, you know, if you were to bolt something together using steel, then potentially the embodied energy is yep. encapsulated and could be reused, and the same with a concrete frame that, you know, once it's up, you could reskin it and reuse it again and again and again. And a lot of people are saying, that actually, you know, uh, you can't do the same with timber, so it's not quite mm. as good okay. Yeah. Uh, as, as, as you might think, it's just the way pe different people assess different things. Yeah. Um, okay. But the, I the idea of, um, of uh, you know, thinking about another layer of construction is something that is adaptable, but also can be taken apart it, it is interesting. Um, I suppose it just depends on timescales. I mean, who's going to yeah. want to take a building apart in 80 years time, you know? Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose it's that thing about if it was a mobile phone and we've run out of those rare metals, people might want to do it. Um, but then um, aren't they starting to mine Victorian rubbish dumps? For They've definitely found, there's definitely somewhere in the UK where they found lots of lithium. Yeah, like there's... So, <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose there's that the, the point that Carlos was making about flexibility because you don't know what what's going to be the, I don't know, the thing that's desired in the future or how things are going to change um, was probably the take, I think the takeaway for me from what you've been saying, Carlos, so, yeah. Oh, well, you said the pavilion, the Spanish exhibit at the Venice Biennale. It might have been, I'm sorry, I'm a bit patchy. It was one of the, um, it was one of the MSA Friday lectures and I think they might have been recorded online. Um, in which case it's yet another thing to watch. <laughs> not that we've, we've, it's not like we've not got <laughs> anything to watch, is it? <laughs> but <laughs> maybe I I'll look that up and I might tweet whether that's the right thing. I think I, it was Chinchilla. I can recommend you the know? adaptation of Brave New World. That's very good. It's on Sky or Now TV. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the list. <laughs> um, but yeah, great. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think, um, yeah, there's not anything else. I'll let you all get back to your your afternoons, but it's nice to see everybody. Um, so there won't, 